Okay, and we're recording. So hi, everybody. I'm um, Steve Wong, and my co-host is uh, Miles Gray. Uh, we're co-chairs of this user group. We're also joined by the user leads, uh, Joe Searcy of T-Mobile, Bryson Shepard of Walmart. Um, I've posted a link in the chat to an agenda document, and if you like, you can leave your name in that list of attendees. Uh, we're going to start with, I guess it isn't on the intro, but um, Robert uh, suggested we go through introductions. So we'll do that first and then we'll move on to an overview of first class disc and CSI. And then finally, uh, Robert put on the agenda a uh, topic of discussing KubeCon Amsterdam and who's gonna be there, what's of interest. Uh, so that said, let's start with some introductions. I'll start with myself. Um, Steve Wong, I've been working on Kubernetes since 2016. Um, I have fairly deep knowledge of storage in Kubernetes and probably better than average in cloud provider, which is the abstraction layer that uh, adapts Kubernetes uh, to the underlying infrastructure that it runs on kind of just broad generic knowledge on the rest of it, networking, et cetera. Uh, Miles, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, thanks, Steve. Um, so I'm Miles Gray. I also work for VMware as part of the HCI business unit. Um, so my primary focus is storage and Kubernetes storage. Uh, I've been working with Kate's not as long as Steve, but since about 2017 or so. Um, and I'm fairly adept with, with most parts of it. So if you have questions on it, and in particular <clears throat> on the storage integrations, I can probably answer your questions if you have any. Um, my role at VMware is technical marketing. So my job is essentially to talk to engineers, read code, figure out how things work, and then uh, write blogs and, and do presentations about it. So that is what I do. I guess we'll go to Joe next. Hey, uh, Joe Searcy. I'm a principal engineer at T-Mobile. I work on T-Mobile's platform engineering team as a technical lead within the Kubernetes space. So responsible for anything and everything around building and consuming Kubernetes as a platform uh, inside T-Mobile. Um, we run our Kubernetes platform on top of VMware, uh, which is probably one of the reasons why I'm here. Um, been working with Kubernetes since around 2017 um, as well um and um upstream contributor on that so pretty pretty good knowledge of kubernetes as a whole um that's it for me uh bryson how about if you go next sure um so i'm with uh, walmart labs so i've been using kubernetes since 2016 i think um end of it might have been 2017 but oh well it's been a few years now so uh yeah we're running our edge kubernetes clusters on vmware so i'm uh, my team is responsible for similar to joe building uh maintaining and that kubernetes platform here at walmart um, i'm specifically one of the architects over our edge clusters um, by edge i mean these are small clusters that we run in our stores um, or, or smaller uh, remote areas, such of our such of our distribution centers. So uh, that's a quick update on me. Uh, I'm just going to go in the order I see the people listed and participants. So Vince Brown. Hello, can everyone hear me? Testing one, two, three. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, very good. Hey, uh, Vince Brown, Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm one of the Nashville VMUG leaders. Um, but new to Kubernetes, so here to learn. I've got a little bit of experience with Docker. Yeah, that's about okay. it. Okay, David Von Thennen. Hey guys, um, so David Von Thennen, work for VMware. Um, I work on uh, the Cloud provider eSphere integration, so that project there. And I also initially worked on the first kind of version, the community version for the CSI driver before it got uh, moved over and converted into the CNS based driver. So, yeah. 
Robert? Yeah, hi, I'm, uh, I'm Robert um, from um, the, the, the Floppy Sysop on Twitter. I work for ITQ, which is a VMware partner in the Netherlands. Um, I'm uh, extremely new to the whole cloud native space. My background is in uh, infrastructure and a bit of storage. Um, I'm very interested in community and in uh, helping people make the, uh, this journey to cloud native and everything that that entails. So that's my, my main reason for being here, but I'm, I'm a very much a Kubernetes noob still. Chip, let's go with you next. Hey, my name is Chip Zoller. I am uh, currently with Dell Technologies where I am a uh, senior principal engineer for Kubernetes and cloud native apps. Uh, and I'm in the VxRail business unit. Um, so I've been working with Kubernetes and cloud native things for the past couple of years. Um, don't consider myself an expert by any stretch of means, um, but uh, I write about it and try and teach and help others with it. And in so doing, learn more about it myself. Michael? Y'all hear me? Can you hear me? All right, cool. Um, hey, I'm Michael Roy. Uh, I'm with VMware, another, yet another VMware guy. Uh, I manage the Fusion and Workstation product group. You might have seen Fusion recently had a little bit of a cool thing where we've got container support now using Containerd, uh, which is pretty exciting. Uh, I've been using Kubernetes. So I remember looking at it in like 2015 when they first open sourced it, and I was working for someone who had a lot of opinions about it. And I believe the funniest thing I heard, it, it kind of reminds me of like Steve Ballmer talking about the iPhone back in the day. And he was like, who's going to get behind a thing that's got such a hubris name as Kubernetes? This is ridiculous. That person is no longer with VMware. So it, uh, it's been a fun journey and, you know, just looking forward to helping out, contributing and, and seeing where this amazing journey goes. Hey, thanks, Michael. By the way, I know that uh, there was a recent, uh, is it a beta of support for Kubernetes with Fusion? So if you want to put that, if you're prepared and you want to put it on the agenda, maybe if we have time, we can get to that during this meeting because I think it might be of interest to people. Sure, we can talk about it. It uh, I don't think I have right access to the agenda. I can, I can request it in the doc, but... Uh, to get it on so I can write it, but yeah. It's, okay, let's uh, see if it's possible we'll run out with, of time, but maybe slate it for the next one if we do. But Yeah, cool, either way. Uh, Kenny, let's have you next. Yeah, absolutely. You, uh, once again at VMware, so I've been doing uh, touch points on Kubernetes, same as Miles and Steve have been for the past few years as well. Uh, into 2018 and then all of 2019, I was part of SIG release, so part of the Kubernetes release team, uh, pretty much for uh, four releases uh, between those two years. And then I am also involved with a uh, commercialized product that will be coming out. Uh, so that's really where my interest is in here, just to kind of see what's going on, see who we have here, and uh, make everybody excited for what's happening in Kubernetes.next world for us. Andrew. Hey, um, so my name is Andrew. Um, I work on Kubernetes at VMware. Um, I help develop the vSphere cloud provider with um, David. And uh, I also work on, uh, I'm also a co-chair of the cloud provider SIG upstream. And I also work on a lot of uh, uh, networking stuff uh, upstream as well. Cool, uh, Kyle. If he's not just lurking, so that's fine. We can go to Keith. Hey, all, Keith here from VMware also. Um, tech marketing in the Mac BU, as someone uh, of you here would know of. Um, been doing Kubernetes since about 2017, um, kind of fitting with what the goal is here with Kubernetes on VMware infrastructure. As back then, I was working for Dell Technologies on doing reference architectures on the XRL for Kubernetes, but uh, now with VMware. Cool. Uh, Ted? Okay, uh, Ted's probably busy as well. Uh, Jing, are you there? Hey. Yeah, um, Xinyang. 
I work for VMware in the cloud native storage team. I work on the CSI driver. I'm also involved in uh, Kubernetes SIG storage upstream. I'm the co-chair of the data protection work group in Kubernetes. And uh, Mikael, you just joined at the end there. Do you want to give us a brief intro, what you do, who you are? Uh, you're muted. Hey, my name is Mikhail. I work at VMware at the team who is responsible for migrating Cloud Foundry to Kubernetes. Uh, yeah, I just joined you here to learn more about VMware involvement in Kubernetes development and further research. Okay, okay cool. thanks. Uh, is that everybody? If we left anybody out, um, pipe in now. Okay, I think, I, good. I think we got most people. We'll move <clears throat> on. So first on the agenda was an overview of first class disk and CSI. If you look in the uh, agenda notes document, I put a bunch of uh, curated uh, resources on these. So we'll not go into a super deep dive on this, but uh, a year ago there wasn't much material and thankfully uh, now there is. The Cormac Ho Hogan blogs are good. Uh, recently, first class disk and cloud native storage were added to the docs. Um, so for those of you maybe not familiar with the, what these terms are, in the history of the vSphere hypervisor, the first generation lasting, I don't know, maybe a decade, uh, associated disks pretty firmly with VMs such that they didn't envision a kind of a VM life cycle where a VM would go down, but its disks would survive and perhaps be mapped to a different VM. And in the world of Kubernetes uh, storage for stateful apps, you've got a de architectural design that envisions pods running stateful apps and these pods have ephemeral connections to um, volumes that have a, an independent life cycle from the VM or pod or uh, cluster node that they get hosted on. And um, uh, recent editions of VMware uh, kind of saw a need independent of Kubernetes for life cycle of disks independent of VMs. But uh, it's fairly recently, meaning six, seven, that these got up to a production grade status with a working API uh, that was in a, you know, was in GA. I think technically uh, it goes all the way back perhaps to 6.0, although you, the API back then might have been under NDA and alpha, meaning it was subject to change. So it wasn't really ready for production. But uh, certainly in the past year, we've moved to a world where these first class disks are out there. Uh, they are still getting backing for tools that do backup. Um, and I think, Miles, I'll turn this over to you because you're more of the subject matter expert on this subject than I am. Sure. Um, yeah, just to, to sort of expand on what Steve was talking about to do with FCDs and their, their origins. Uh, it was originally built for a feature of a product really called um, App Volumes for VMware View. And it was basically to allow you to put apps in individual VMDKs. And then if you needed them in a guest OS, they would mount those. So they needed to persist across a life cycle that was not associated with the VM. So we went and decided to reuse that first class disks concept for a number of reasons, but the primary one being it's a global catalog that is not tied to a VM. So if you create a first class disk, there's a record of that VMDK in the vCenter database that uniquely identifies that first class disk. Now, if any of you work, have worked in sysadmin in the past, you'll know that whenever you delete VMs that have VMDKs that are unattached, you end up with orphans on your uh, VMFS and NFS data stores. And it's a real pain to, to try and clean that stuff up. So FCD does away with all that problem because we have a, a database that keeps a record of um, 
every single one of these FCD volumes that is provisioned uh, from, from a vCenter. So uh, we took that concept and we thought, well, if we are going to use it for app volumes, we can use it for Kubernetes volumes as well. So the first implementation uh, that we ever did of any kind of storage for Kubernetes was not CSI based and it was not FCD based. And that's probably what most of you are using today. So if anyone's using Red Hat OpenShift, Google Anthos, Enterprise PKS, Rancher, any packaged Kate solution today, it uses the VCP. You can install the CSI if you want, but out of the box, almost all of them use the VCP. So it doesn't use the first class disks concept. It's just the standard VMDK created on a data store, mounted into a VM um, sort of thing. We don't have the global tracking for it. So uh, with uh, CSI and with CNS, it being a core feature, of the vSphere platform, we decided that we wanted to have something a little bit more robust, make it easier to track, make it easier to operationalize. So that's the first class disk stuff out of the way. Um, Do you mind uh, if I butt in here, Miles? I just want to point out that uh, I, I think that first class disk is deemed production grade today, but it is dependent on using vSphere 6.7 U3. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the reason that a lot of these distros are still back on the on the older interface is that realistically there are a lot of enterprise users that have three five year life cycles get their licenses for the hypervisor with at the time the hardware is purchased and if you're walking in the shoes of a kubernetes distribution uh, you might have customers that can't move on uh, that aren't on 6.7 U3 and have difficulties moving there quickly. So mm -hmm. this is a this is something that's in transition. If you're putting in new greenfield, I'd be looking at 6.7 U3 and first class disk. But for now, it's okay if you stick with the older stuff. Now, mm -hmm. looking down the road, say a year or more from now, at some point, Kubernetes itself is getting rid of entry storage drivers, uh, the entry cloud provider, and you need to be looking at transition plans if you're on that older stuff, but it's probably not an emergency. I'll back mm -hmm. to you, Miles. Sure, um, just to add a bit more history to it as well, because you know, like, like most things, it's not just as simple as I made it sound. We had the VCP to begin with, which you know that supported uh, vSphere versions way back. I think it was like 6.0, it supported right back to because 6.0 didn't have the FCD concept. Uh, we introduced FCD uh, for VMFS and NFS in 6.5, and then for vSAN in 6.7 U1. So uh, there was a project came out of MapBU, so the Modern App Platforms BU that uh, Andrew and Keith work for, and they built an implementation of CSI based on the FCD APIs that, that existed there. And that worked from uh, 6.5 for VMFS and NFS, and 6.7 U1 for vSAN. Now, whenever we built the CNS feature itself, uh, we wanted to add a new API to front FCD. So uh, from, from our perspective in HCIBU, um, the FCD API didn't have all of the, the stuff that we wanted in it. So we put a new API in front of it called CNS and we abstracted out the backend FCD API. So essentially what this means is any calls now in 6.7 U3 and the, the current upstream version of the driver, they go into CNS and CNS does all the backend work. So that means we can swap out backend. So we don't need to use FCD in future or if we wanted to add like a file services uh, backend in future, we can do that without having to uh, significantly refactor the upstream CSI driver. So, uh, it is that feature, the CNS part, and the current upstream that requires 6.7 U3. And like Steve said, there is a period of transition here. People don't just upgrade their vSphere environments overnight. We're very conscious of that. Um, but we're hoping with the new releases of vSphere that are coming out in the near future that the cadence of people actually updating things will become a little bit more, um, let's say, uh, cloud friendly, where you know, you're iterating every uh, six months or so rather than waiting a year or two for it to become mature and then, then update. All right. Does anyone have Miles, any questions at this point? Talking, I noticed in the mm -hmm. uh, notes doc that Bryson added a question mark comment 
saying that he noticed that in the docs, the minimum version supported move from 6.7 U2 up to U3, if you can add some color on that. Yeah, uh, I wrote those docs and it was a typo. So <laughs> sorry about that. Um, yeah, it is 6.7 U3 and above. Um, so does anyone have any questions on, you know, the vSphere cloud provider, CSI, first class disks, where we are today, compatibility, anything like that? Yeah, I have a question. Um, go for it. The, um, can you talk a little bit about where, uh, where you are and some plans support with the new snapshot mechanism in Kubernetes and how that's going to trickle down to the CSI? Is that functionality there today? Is it, if it is, is it considered stable? Just a little bit around that because I know that a lot of users are, are curious. That's one of the more uh, intriguing features of one of the latest Kubernetes releases. So mm -hmm. Sure. Maybe we should let like Shing speak about that unless you want to go for it, Miles. It, uh, I mean, Jing is, is basically writing that. So let's let uh, Jing talk about it. Uh, so the CSI snapshot feature goes to beta in 17 So that is uh, stable now, of course. Uh, we want to get feedback and if there are any bugs we need to fix it before going to GA. Uh, and the next question is uh, when are we going to get add a supporting uh, our driver, our CSI driver? So that is still work in progress. Uh, I actually cannot really give you a uh, time on when that will be released. So, oh, that's okay. I think yeah. the guys understand that we can't announce timelines for, for future releases of stuff. It's the same as, as VMworld guys. We can't give you timelines for stuff like this, but it is in the works is the important part. Okay. Now, the other thing is a lot of these, you know, when it comes to snapshots, there's different phases where it's getting enabled through CSI and then working groups under storage. Um, then you typically hook it up to use it with backup tools like uh, Valero, for example. And that stuff is out in the open and not gated by, you know, product releases. I know there was a session on it at uh, KubeCon North America back in November. Uh, so let me find a link yeah. to that and I'll put it in the notes. Yeah, uh, so I actually, yeah, I went to that session. They did a POC using the CSI driver. Uh, I heard uh, Valero is going to add that support sometime in March, but we can verify that, but that's what I remembered. Bryson, did you have any questions? Um, well, on that, uh, the, I guess for Jing, the, mm -hmm. you, you said it's beta in 117. How stable, yeah. I mean, right now, this, we don't even have snapshots, so I don't even know if, it, is uh, even trying it would probably be better than not trying it, right? Uh, yeah, well, right now, if you want to try it, you can only try some some like sample drivers if you want to try that. But otherwise, if you want to try vSphere, we really don't have that. Okay, so, try so you, you have it um, in 117 in beta. What did you mean? Uh, that's, uh, that, this is, I'm talking about Kubernetes. So Kubernetes 1.17 release, that oh, is beta, okay. meaning- That's beta there, there, but you don't have it available. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. yeah. It's a, there's, a feature, there's a feature gate when it was alpha in Kubernetes, that there's a feature gate. So that will be off by default. You have to enable that to use it. But now beta then meaning it's enabled by default. Okay, I okay, got yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so spec. Spec is beta, but our implementation yeah. is not there yet. Is not there yet. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the same situation with the disk expansion abilities. Same. Correct. Disk expansion uh, actually should be there uh, sometime in April in our two dot CSI driver two dot O release. So the driver, the, the one that is available in GitHub. So when uh, have when we have our two dot O release, we should have the expansion but uh, but I think that's the thing that uh, Miles has been testing and we only support offline expansion so I just need to be aware of that yeah 
Yeah, if you if you have a burning need for for CSI resize or resize of volumes, there'll be something there in the near future. Um, but there are challenges around doing online disk expansion and that kind of thing that we need to remediate first. Uh, if if you want like uh, true end to end support where it does everything for you. Are there any other questions in the agenda? Yeah, I'd probably list this in the documentation, but um, the, I guess, the, what's the minimum for all of the different components that you have to have under there? So you've got vSphere, um, 6.7 U3. Um, do you have a minimum Kubernetes version that you're calling out for uh, this CSI? Mm -hmm. well. uh, 1.14. 1 1.14, okay. Yep. So platform needs to be 6.7 U3, and that's not just VC, that's the hosts as well, because there's host level uh, data path changes too. Um, so across the board, 6.7 U3 and 1.14 or above. But I think currently we've qualified up to 1.16, but not 1.17 yet. So across the board, vCenter and the SXIs, what if you had a pocket of VSXIs that were back level but not involved with Kubernetes? Is that still okay? That's cool. Yeah, okay. it's only the, the cluster it actually interacts with that, that needs to be at 6.7 U3. So usually uh, whenever I talk to customers, they're setting up new environments for this stuff anyway, so it's not that big of a deal, or they'll just set up an extra cluster in their existing VC and upgrade the VC and just have that uh, cluster itself as a pocket of 6.7 U3 with all of their, their other info there. Does anyone else have any questions? No? All right. Is there anything else in the doc before I move on a bit? Okay, and then maybe we can, the next on the agenda then is KubeCon Amsterdam. So the schedule mm -hmm. for that just came out in the last 10 days or so. Uh, there, uh, there are, I mean, a crude way to find things that might be in, of interest to people running on um, uh, running Kubernetes on top of VMware infrastructure would be just to search the schedule for the keyword VMware. So I did that just to save people the trouble. And what I found was this kind of category list. There is a extra cost pre-event called Kubernetes Academy sponsored by VMware. But I'm going to tell people that if you're looking for v, it, it's good material to teach you Kubernetes intro, but it is not vSphere specific in any way. So it, don't assume that just because it's presented by VMware that it's uh, focused on vSphere. This is useful training on Kubernetes running anywhere in a public cloud on vSphere or not on vSphere at all. Uh, and it's that generic. Um, there are sessions by VMware people on build packs. That once again is platform neutral. The whole thing, idea of that is to run application builds that can run anywhere. There are a number of Harbor sessions, Harbor being the container image repository. I think technically that's not tied to vSphere, but it, the Venn diagram of people running Kubernetes on top of VMware and people interested in Harbor probably has high overlap simply because you're going to be potentially running on-prem in private data centers. And this, this is my opinion, but a pretty strongly held one that you are going to want to be running a container image registry for almost all those use cases. And you need to have some sort of solution. So uh, Harbor is an independent CNCF project, not part of Kubernetes, but I think those sessions might be of interest. There are a number of data protection sessions on the agenda. Uh, the user group itself is going to have a session at um, noon on, was it Tuesday, Miles, or Wednesday? I can't remember. I think it, well, the only thing I remember is the day began with a T. That's literally it, so okay. probably Tuesday. And uh, so we'll have an intro session there. We only get 35 minutes, so probably not a deep dive, but we'll go into something. Um, and I'm thinking of having a face-to-face -face lunch uh, at the event for people who are there in per person. Um, that could be as uh, 
informal as getting some signs made because these conferences, the KubeCons usually have their own lunch. Uh, and I haven't, I don't want to commit to going out to a restaurant because I'm not familiar with the area to know if there's anything nearby. So we're likely to have something, but at TBD, what exactly it is. Um, the other sessions there, they had some on artifact management that looked interesting. Um, and sessions on the cloud providers, which applies to kind of the, it's if you're using a distro, maybe getting into the cloud provider is something your vendor took care of. But if you're going cube ADM uh, or doing your own installs, that that's good material for getting a deep dive perspective of what's really going on under the covers and might be essential if you're kind of growing your own rather than using a distro. Anybody else got any thoughts on things they know of or noticed um, at KubeCon? And then Robert is organizing something called, uh, he's organizing a VBeers event. So I think Long time vSphere users are familiar with these VBeers events, but maybe people coming from the other direction of uh, first discovering Kubernetes and then electing to run it on top of vSphere have never heard of these. But Robert, maybe you could describe this. And even as a local in Amsterdam, maybe you can describe kind of what th these are like in your community. Okay, so um, a VBeers is a very informal uh, get together usually at a bar or a cafe um, to just to, um, to meet each other's network, to, to, to swap war stories um, and just to get to know uh, each other. It's just, it's just a community building activity. Um, the one I'm doing at the um, at KubeCon will be at a, um, at um, the conference center itself in Amsterdam has five or six on-premise bars slash restaurants. I'm organizing this at one of those but there's a little risk involved there because I don't know how busy it will be. And the, um, the invite link is up to 15 people now. So that's quite nice. Um, the VBiz events in the Netherlands are usually not very big. There's, um, I think the biggest one is in Amsterdam, which is held every few months, it's not organized by me. Um, and about 20 people can show up to that. Um, there's one in the Hague, which is only about eight of us usually. <laughs> and there are, there are one or two others in the country. Um, but, um, the reason for wanting to, to do one at the KubeCon was um, seeing a lot of people from the VMware and the V community and the V expert community indicating interests in, um, the, in Kubernetes, in the CNCF, in the community around that. Uh, so this seemed like a perfect cross pollination effort uh, or you know, timing. Um, but um, it's probably going to be pretty busy um, at, at the conference centers over those days, especially on the Tuesday. Um, I'm not planning on moving it. I'm, I'm just kind of, I think we'll just have to wing it and see how busy it is. Um, if it means we're all standing around with a beer in our hand, you know, that's probably fine too. And then correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that this isn't likely to need a conference badge so that for those who might travel with a significant other or something, I think that it would be okay to bring them along and not have difficulties. I haven't actually visited the location, but everything I've managed to ascertain is that the cafes and restaurants do not require a conference badge to get into. They're on the outside of the conference areas. Um, but I'm will, I'm actually, I might actually go there to, to check just to be completely certain. Um, given this is sort of our uh, first or inaugural meeting, um, and most of you are, are kind of new to this space, or at least some of you are new to this space and maybe just want to get up and running with gates on vSphere, um, I would say probably the easiest way, if you just want to try it out in your environment and you know kick the tires and see how it works. Um, Andrew has been working on a project uh, along with another guy called um, Andrew Kutz called uh, Cluster API for vSphere. And that's without a doubt the easiest way to get set up uh, installing Kubernetes on a vSphere environment. So uh, I threw a link uh, into the agenda there. I've written a blog on, on how to use it, how to get started. So if you just want to kick the tires on Kubernetes with vSphere, uh, that's where you want to go and check that out. Um, but, you know, given we've got a bunch of time left as well, and Michael's here. Um, Michael, do you want to chat about Kubernetes on desktop? 
Oh, yeah, sure. We can talk about that. Um, so yeah, so we launched this thing in a tech preview format not too long ago, um, about two weeks now or so. And uh, internally, we've been having this overarching project, right? And we've been calling that Project Nautilus. And really, what that is is a transformation of Fusion and Workstation to be, you know, modern application builder friendly. And the way that we do that is by you know leveraging sort of the best components in the open source community and building that on top of our hypervisor and um, so we had our initial release like i said a couple weeks ago and um, so right now we're able to run containers we can pull push um, and and run containers build is coming very soon and so that that's sort of where the technology is at but we're leveraging under the hood container d we're leveraging run C, you know, we have stuff that we had built for the project Pacific work over on vSphere. And we've merged all that basically into the, the Fusion and Workstation code base. Uh, interestingly, if folks don't know, Fusion and Workstation are actually the same hypervisor code as ESX. Same monitor code, same scheduler, it's all, you know, we have one team working on it all together. Uh, and then we have like a separate team on top of Fusion that creates the UI layer. And that's where we're working on uh, that sort of UX around uh, what we're calling vCuddle. Uh, so VCTL, uh, the ability to manage these containers and operate these new things need, needed an interface. Um, as it goes on, we're, you know, we want to look at it more inside the UI and easy buttons and whatnot, but step one, make it run containers. Step two um, is working with the open source community in particular, um, Kind and the folks over in the SIG cluster lifecycle. Uh, so we've been talking to Ben Elder and, and some of the other folks over there about how can we um, think about uh, the provider concept as it applies to Kind. And you know maybe there's a variety of different runtimes that make sense. So you know we're going to see what what we can sort of do to work in concert there. Uh, but ultimately, I would like to see a story whereby we have hey if you have kind installed, you can point it at Fusion or Workstation with a flag, and away it goes. Um, otherwise, if you don't, we would like to have a, that easy button for folks that don't want to go through maybe all that sort of manual work. Give them that sort of here's my Kubernetes environment, and then you can get up and running. Um, did anybody want to see a little bit, like I could show a quick demo if uh, anybody wants? I've seen head nods. All right, cool. Sure. The other thing is I, I went and looked at it uh, when there was a little publicity coming over Twitter with a link. And back a few weeks when I looked at it, it sort of implied that it was for Fusion only. But for people running Workstation on Linux or Windows, you're saying you, you, this stuff is good there too? It will be. Okay. So if, you know, we had to, so in getting, for example, container D, container D is a Linux binary, it's in Go, we ported that to Mac, so it actually runs statively on the Mac. Uh, we're doing the same for Windows and we're thinking about the right approach for Linux. It's hard and it's a different sort of category for us. Um, you know, like it represents a tiny number of our users, but it's incredibly important. So we're, we're trying to figure out the right thing there, but definitely, you know, give it on, put it on Windows. Uh, our tech preview, we didn't get the Windows binary done in time, but when we do the release for this, which isn't going to be, you know, very long, very far from now, uh, it'll be included in Windows. Uh, I don't think I can share unless someone wants to add me as a host. Okay, let me try that. Thanks, Steve. And maybe if we have time at the uh, the end, Andrew, I don't know how keen you are, but could you do like a brief overview of Cluster API for vSphere and, and sort of what that is and how it works? Yeah, and somebody left a question on wanting to, wanting to know. Yeah, I had a question. I actually almost, I think we could probably almost do a Cluster API for vSphere for a meeting. Well, sure. there, there is its own, there is a Cluster API um, SIG, if I'm not mistaken, or working group, but yeah, we could go into it. Well, I mean, specifically on uh, the vSphere stuff to okay. kind of go over over that. But yeah, I do have a question after he's done with his demo. Cool. So, you know, one of the things that we're doing that's a little different is we're, we're leveraging GitHub. Um, we want to be more open and, and, you know, be where folks are. And I've been using GitHub for a long time, so it just made sense to put our documentation there. And now that GitHub has GitHub pages, uh, we put a nice little lander for it. Exciting. Uh, but you get the tech preview, you know, it's a direct link, installs it, it everything is self-contained inside the binary. It's also licensed, so you can just keep running it. That license is going to be good till closer to the end of the year. It's going to be hard for folks to expire it, given the, the number of releases we're going to have. 
Um, and then within the GitHub repository inside of the Nautilus repo, uh, we have our docs. So there's our, uh, you know, getting started guide, uh, which basically covers, you know, your, uh, the typical use cases that we're currently supporting. Uh, but if you want to get into the thick of it, uh, you want to look at our man pages. And so we have, you know, a page for all the different commands that we can do and how they work and, you know, things like that. So we're accepting issues and pull requests. Please share us your thoughts. You know, we're all, we're all keen. So uh, as far as getting it running, like I said, we use a tool called, we created a tool called vcuddle. So if I do vcuddle system status, um, I am currently running the container runtime. Uh, I turned it on a moment ago. So here it is running just kind of natively, gives you an idea of what it does, the different commands that we have. So we can, with respect to containers, we can delete, describe, uh, you know, we can run commands within them, shell into them, uh, list image, list stuff about that. We can, um, and then, you know, start, stop, run, and check version. So you're kind of typical things that you would want to do with a container. So what's different about it, sort of the approach to how it actually goes ahead and creates the container. It, uh, you know, we, ported some of the project that we had done in Project Pacific for this concept around where they have this pod VM. So it's this tiny little Linux based on Photon virtual machine that uh, is purpose built for this. It's got almost nothing in it except for the kernel so that we can expose C groups. And then we have a, a CRX uh, runtime in front of that, which is like a derivative of run C. And, uh, and in front of that, we have our implementation of container D and some shimming along the way. So if I, let's run a container. Uh, Let's see. So I'll list my images. So these are the ones that I've got and I've created one and I've given a, a tag here. So that would be just, if I show you the command tag, you know, tag image, the full path of my image to uh, something that I can call it nice and simple like. So that way I don't have to type out the full path of the, uh, the, red, the, the repo where the image is being stored. Because we don't assume Docker Hub, so we, let folks kind of specify whatever. So we would do, for example, uh, pull image right here, and I've already you know got it. So it's just going to quickly unpack the layers and then rebuild the uh, the image. Done. So if I were to now just do, let's see. Uh, so we're going to run container. This could also be, this is an alias, so container or C wouldn't matter. We're going to give that container a name. We're going to call it my www. The image that we're going to use is my Hugo, and we're going to run it detached. So once it launches, um, you know, so what it's doing right now is firing up a virtual machine, very tiny one. Uh, it's a one-to-one -one mapping relationship between virtual machine and uh, Docker host, container host, or I should say, sorry, container. So the, uh, we can see now that it's running. And if we do the run list, uh, there's that, that particular container image. So if we do vcuddle describe container, uh, that container, actually let's just, just so we can see it running. Uh, LSC, which is the same as vcuddle get containers, aliases are wonderful. Um, so we can see the name of it, the image it's using, the command that it's running, which is just some nginx. The IP of the VM, uh, and notice there's no port mapping here, and uh, and you know when it was created. So we can then do um, also describe drive container my, and this gives us a little bit more further details, and we could even very quickly shell into it. So for example, if I just copy that, paste. Now we're shelled into that uh, the container host, so the, the the pod VM. And if you see, sorry, the kernel, you can see it's a photon derivative. And if you do, if you look at top, you can see we have our our processes, the nginx stuff, uh, our CRX runtime here. Uh, we have this thing called the Spherelet agent, which is uh, like a kubelet. So some of the primitives that we put in Project Pacific are starting to show up here. And, um, and yeah, and the, not much else. Some IRQs and, and a lightweight version of VMware tools. Is, is this like kind of runtime environment? Like does it adhere to like the CRI spec? 
Absolutely, it's uh, it's uh, OCI from the container images, and the, the runtime itself is. Uh, we're going to try to go through the process to get it officially certified, but yeah, that's exactly it. Very cool. Yeah. So, Michael, I noticed that all the commands, in comparison to say Docker run, you specify container. Why do you have to specify container? Yeah, it's a good question. I think it's a there's some open discussion around how to evolve this. Uh, I think there's there's the I would very much like it if it just knew the type of object that we're giving it and it did the right thing. Um, I think that as the types of objects we can manipulate with vCode grows, it might make sense to specify. Uh, but I think there should be some also some defaults there. So I'd be very open to, um, you know, adjusting some of the syntax on how it works because it's tough. We're trying to kind of combine a little bit of Kubecut, a little bit of Docker, but also it's doing this new thing. Um, so part of it as well is just how we're assembling it as we're going. You know, in terms of it's it's a Go project, so all the sub commands are are modular, so you can absolutely sort of roll them all up and whatnot. But this helps to sort of set, separate the the functions that we're trying to do as we've been developing it out. Is is the concept of one container per VM, is that kind of like a tenant of the overall design or do you see that changing down the road where you might have multiple containers per VM? Yeah, I think it's definitely going to change. It's something that we specified to be opinionated to get it running and to get it out. And as we go forward, I want to be able to have a, a bunch of grace for more, more graceful orchestration there. So, you know, a bunch of containers inside of one Docker host. Uh, or like one pop, uh, sandbox VM. Is it one it. container per VM or one pod? <laughs> it's one container. Okay. Yeah, we we sort of been using the the terms interchangeably, but um, yeah, it's it's like one container, you know, one implementation on C groups that is running on the uh, on the sandbox virtual machine. But absolutely, we want to be able to give folks control. I could see a future where we have, you know, a way to describe a series of containers all within one file and some command line options that says, hey, just keep using this one VM, it's safe, or, you know, specify some other combination of ones and many's. And, or or and thresholds to say, like, X number of containers per VM automatically spin up a new VM when you reach that threshold. Exactly. Right. And, and we're very open to, like, figuring this out the right way. We know that it's tough. So like Docker, for example, made a lot of opinionated decisions. Some of them we're familiar with, but we might not have liked. Some of them we think that there might be a better way. Uh, we very much want to have this as an open dialogue and an open discussion with the community and, and, and kind of get that, you know, that, that, that loop closed as opposed to just coming in and saying, this is how we're doing it. And we're super opinionated and it's going to be like this. Right. I think what we're trying to do is be able to control VMs, containers, and Kubernetes clusters in like a uniform way. Um, and it, there's one way to do that in terms of how we're going to be interacting with vSphere, which is through kubectl. Uh, but on the desktop, that might not make the same kind of sense. So, you know, we're open to suggestion there. But I guess the, the, sorry, Michael, the network is a 172.16. looks like a bridge network. Is there a way, because this is run on Fusion, to just bridge it to DHCP? Um, it's actually running on a NAT network, it's, or rather a, okay. a, cust, a custom VM net. So if I were to actually uh, look at it, it would be VM net 10, and you can assign other VMs to those networks and then just open them up. So this is accessible from my host, so because it's just one of my um, VM nets, right? So VM list, this networks. Yeah, no, sorry. I forget the command to list the network. It's some ridiculous syntax. Um, and part of why we're building these command line tools is because the syntax of VM run is silly and potentially. Yeah, and just in data. case there's people who don't know what a VM net is, it's it, when you install one of the desktop hypervisors, it's a private virtual network. Is it fair to say that runs on your laptop or your desktop? Exactly. So showing showing it to you here. So we have it's it's this this is the network that it created. Right, and if you were to look at the VM, which shows up here right now, we we, we obscure it from the uh, the library for now, but you'd see that the NIC has this uh, network attached to it. And you know, when in here you can do cool things like um, set NTUs, uh, you know, change some of the concepts of the DHCP. And right now you have to do that through the UI or through um, VM Run, but uh, that's an area that we're going to obviously expose through the vCuddle interface. It's kind of cool to have these virtu multiple virtual networks because I know I've played around for a demo for a talk of getting Istio to run, not on this, but on 
last generation desktop hypervisor, but are there people toying around with service mesh and getting that running in this environment to uh, get some driving test time on it? I think it's early, but I'm, if someone wants to take a spin at it and tell us where it breaks, I'm game. Okay. How, how does storage work? in this so like with traditional docker you know i can pass through a local directory but since we've got the vm layer kind of in between here is, is that still operable or yeah it is uh, we're actually using 9pfs uh, to do some host guest sharing stuff um, and part of the way that it currently works is there's like this dng which gets dropped inside of your home folder um, so if you were to look at um, you know, so there's some storage here and some some config, um, and if you look inside the, you know, the the folder itself, there's you know the container D stuff as well as so then the uh, the mount uh, folders here. So right now there's like this hacky way of doing it. I'm gonna do a write up on how to like you know do that, but ultimately yeah, we wanna we have host guest file system as a proprietary VMware thing, but we also have uh, nine PFS working. So the intention is to be able to do, you know, vcuddle folder mounted you know, and have it show up as whatever within the guest. Um, and it's also gonna be exposed as we do our build. So when we have build, the ability to just uh, define all those inside of the Docker file and have it come up and go is uh, part of the roadmap. Just to add a bit more color to that as well, um, Fusion isn't the only thing that uses 9P in the VMware stack. There's some upcoming stuff that you'll see in the near future uh, that uses 9P for, for backing data stores on vSphere itself. Um, and it's because it's a zero copy data path. Essentially, it's just a mapping straight through. There's no hops, no latency. It's just mapped right through. So it's really, really quick. Yeah, the engineers really liked it. I originally asked, like, how come we're not just using, just using HGFS for everything? And they said, no, no, 9P all the way. Is there a cool. link on 9P if I want to learn more about it? Maybe somebody could patch that into the notes. It'd be great. Yeah, I don't know what it would be, but I'm sure it's easy to find. Okay. I'll, I'll get, get a link. Yeah, it's a it's an open source project anyway. Yeah. Uh, so okay. yeah, I'll stop sharing here. I mean, that's kind of uh, the 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 end to end where we're at right now. Like I said, we want to work closely with the folks over in Kind to really deliver the Kubernetes part of this. We're just getting started now. This is the very first sort of iteration of it. Step one, run containers. Step two, Kubernetes clusters. Step three, we want to have a declarative deployment model. I want to be able to point. You know, you cut a lot of YAML file that says, here's a bunch of networks, here's a bunch of VMs, some clusters, some containers, glue it together like so and run. Um, and, you know, how we get that, you know, we're going to have to work on it together. Okay, thanks, Michael. That was a great demo. Um, we're almost near the top of the hour, five minutes left. Uh, Bryson, I know you wanted to get to the, uh, your question on cluster API and affinity. I saw in the chat that Andrew Saikim has recommended that maybe we can dedicate the next a future user group meeting. Maybe the why don't yeah, we yeah, shoot yeah. for the next one? I, I agree. The cluster API that would be a different one. That my question isn't a cluster API question. Okay. Um, it's more of a question of if we have if we have a pod and affinity rules set up so that we have pods not running on the same node. We also essentially want them not to run on the same zone or the same, you know, physical host. Um, otherwise, we might. The issue is if we don't have it set up like that, you might have them running on different VMs, but still in the same physical host. That physical host takes those down at the same time. So what we're trying to do is we have a situation where maybe a node, a physical host, goes into maintenance mode, um, and it moves. Uh, it moves VMs that were on different physical hosts onto the same host. So when that pod was originally scheduled, it was scheduled on different hosts and different VMs. But when that happens now, they're susceptible running on the same um, host. So I, I think, Miles, it looks like you get what I'm saying. Um, is there, is that something you guys have already looked at? Is there a, something we need to be looking at how we're doing that? So, that is a really interesting and hard problem because um, Kate's is sort of built around the paradigm of, you know, a host dies and that's it. Or, you know, it goes down for maintenance and it's offline. We don't really have that concept because we can move stuff around with the motion. Um, when we looked at this in the past, there was a thought of 
uh, we can assign node labels to each of the pods or each of those volumes um, that's based on the host that that sits on. Whenever it moves or whenever a vMotions, there would be something in the uh, vSphere API or a controller uh, in Kate itself that checks that, figures out where it is and updates the label so it's not compliant or whatever. Honestly, I have not heard a good solution to this problem because it's not a trivial thing to fix. What you described is exactly kind of what I was hoping we could do, you know, update those labels. Um, and right now, at least on the version of uh, Kubernetes we're on right now, it, it, it's only, it only allows you at uh, scheduling to do that. So the problem is, e even if you were to change that, it wouldn't go reschedule it to a different node. Um, so Andrew on mute, I think he's probably got an opinion on this. Yeah, so there was some proposals uh, last year to add like a specific topology label for uh, physical hosts. And it was, uh, we, we didn't go forward with it for that exact reason that uh, on platforms like vSphere, like if you vMotion, you know, if you, you know, transfer a pod to a different physical topology, there's nothing that would reschedule the node or the pod to, to, to match that topology. And even if you did like dynamically swap the topology on a node, like that messes up a lot of different things. And so I think like the, the uh, David can, can add to this too. Like the, the way to do that right now is that you would just, uh, you would disable any you know, vMotion from happening in your cluster, and then you would use the zone topology as your physical topology. And that should address most use cases. So, I mean, that would definitely, that would take it down. It would almost be better to have it be, you know, up and just have both of those, uh, I guess if you took it down, then it would reschedule it to somewhere else if it could, so, but. What, yeah, that would be the what you, could, what you could probably do is stick a no schedule taint on it and have some kind of controller that just kills all the pods on it whenever whenever it gets v motioned. That would force a reschedule of all the pods to whatever other nodes. Maybe something like that would work. It's a hack, but it might fix it. So there there is um, they are changing I don't I don't know which version it's coming in, but so that it's the anti affinity rules won't just be schedule on schedule. It'll actually be when running too. So that we would should be able to look at some of those things and the ideas when it's running if that were to change then it should reschedule it somewhere else so um, we are yeah, thinking I, about I, that I, yeah i think like if we can dynamically reschedule then the we can reopen the proposal on specifically adding a topology label for physical hosts but until then i think the recommended thing has been use the zone tags to make uh, the topology Okay, this, I was hoping you guys were gonna have something already solved for me, but. <laughs> Hard problem. <laughs> um, Andrew, yeah, let me, let's sync up after and I'll show you what I'm looking at. Maybe uh, we can see if there's something coming in the future, at least for this. Yeah, sounds good. And then a good place to have that chat if you think others might be able to help or uh, benefit from this would be just go put it in the user group channel on the Kubernetes Slack. Yeah, sounds good. It, if there's nothing Walmart specific in there, that is obviously. Yeah. It's just, I mean, this is, this thing's just a general, if anyone could be in this situation. Perfect. All right, well, we're at the top of the hour. Uh, we've taken the whole thing up there. I, we have a lot more to talk about. It would appear um, and people are keen for uh, intros and other features like cluster API for vSphere and, and what have you. Um, we will uh, draft up a, an agenda for the next meeting in, in a month's time. So that'll be uh, March 6th or so. I don't know what the actual uh, date is, but the first Thursday of March. Um, if anyone else has any ideas for topics that you would like to talk about, or maybe you have uh, something interesting that you've done that you would like to present and show, um, throw those in the agenda as well. Yeah, and we had a poll to pick this meeting time, but I didn't actually put it up for discussion, the frequency. I wanted to start with monthly, uh, just not to water it down too much, but if anybody as the year progresses feels that these things get busy enough that we need to do it more frequently, uh, we can entertain doing that. But see you in a month.
Thanks everyone for joining. Thanks guys. Good discussion. Cheers. Thanks guys. Later.